Section 15 of Curiosities of Literature, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Curiosities of Literature, Volume 3, by Isaac de Azraeli, of a biography painted. There are objects connected with literary curiosity, whose very history, though they may never gratify our sight, is literary, and the originality of their invention, should they excite imitation, may serve to constitute a class. I notice a book curiosity of this nature. This extraordinary volume may be said to have contained the travels and adventures of Charles Magnus, a noble Venetian, and this volume, so precious, consisted only of eighteen pages, composed of a series of high-finished miniature paintings on vellum, some executed by the hand of Paul Vernos. Each page, however, may be said to contain many chapters, for, generally, it is composed of a large centerpiece, surrounded by ten small ones, with many apt inscriptions, allegories, and allusions, the whole exhibiting romantic incidents in the life of this Venetian nobleman. It, but it is not merely as a beautiful production of art that we are to consider it, it becomes associated with a more elevated feeling in the occasion which produced it. The author, who is himself the hero, after having been long calumniated, resolved to set before the eyes of his accusers the sufferings and adventures he could perhaps have but indifferently described and instead of composing a tedious volume for his justification, invented this new species of pictorial biography. The author minutely described the remarkable situations in which fortune had placed him, and the artist, in embellishing the facts he furnished them with to record, emulated each other in giving life to their truth, and putting into action before the spectator incidents which the pen had less impressively exhibited this unique production may be considered as a model to represent the actions of those who may succeed more fortunately by this new mode of perpetrating their history discovering by the aid of the pencil rather than by their pen the forms and colors of an extraordinary life. It was when the Ottomans, about 1571, attacked the Isle of Cyprus, that this Venetian nobleman was charged by his republic to review and repair the fortifications. He was afterwards sent to the Pope to negotiate an alliance. He returned to the Senate to give an account of his commission. Invested with the chief command at the head of his troops, Magnus threw himself into the island of Cyprus, and after a skilful defense, which could not prevail its fall, at Farmagasta he was taken prisoner by the Turks and made a slave. His age and infirmities induced his master, at length, to sell him to some Christian merchants, and after an absence of several years from his beloved Venice, he suddenly appeared, to the astonishment and mortification of a party who had never ceased to calumniate him, while his own noble family were compelled to preserve an indignant silence, having had no communications with their lost and enslaved relative. Magnus now returned to vindicate his honor, to reinstate himself in the favor of the Senate, and to be restored to a venerable parent amidst his family, 
to whom he introduced a fresh branch in a youth of seven years old the child of his misfortunes who born in trouble and a stranger to domestic endearments was at one moment united to a beloved circle of relations i shall give a rapid view of some of the pictures of this venetian nobleman's life the whole series has been elaborately drawn up by the duke de la valery the celebrated book collector who dwells on the detail with the curiosity of an amateur footnote the duke's description is not to be found as might be expected in his own valued catalogue but was a contribution to gagnats i i sixteen where it occupies fourteen pages this singular work sold at gagnant's sale for nine hundred and two livres it was then the golden age of literary curiosity when the rarest things were not ruinous and that price was even then considered extraordinary though the work was an unique it must consist of about a hundred and eighty subjects by italian artists and note in a rich frontispiece a christ is expiring on the cross religion leaning on a column contemplates a divinity and hope is not distant from her the genealogical tree of the house of magnus with an allegorical representation of venice its nobility power and riches the arms of magnus in which is inserted a view of the holy sculpture of jerusalem of which he was made a knight his portrait with a latin inscription i have passed through arms and the enemy amidst fire and water and the lord conducted me to a safe asylum in the year of grace fifteen seventy one the portrait of his son aged seven years finished with the greatest beauty and supposed to have come from the hand of paul verones it bears this inscription overcome by violence and artifice almost dead before his birth his mother was at length delivered of him full of life with all the loveliness of infancy under the divine protection his birth was happy and his life with greater happiness shall be closed with good fortune a plan of the isle of cyprus where magnus commanded and his first misfortune happened his slavery by the turks the painter has expressed this by an emblem of a tree shaken by the winds and scathed by the lightning but from the trunk issues a beautiful green branch shining in a brilliant sun with this device from this fallen trunk springs a branch full of vigor the missions of magnus to raise troops in the province of la puglia in one of these magnus is seen returning to venice his final departure a thunderbolt is viewed falling on his vessel his passage by corfu and zante and his arrival at candia his travels to egypt the centre figure represents this province raising its right hand extended towards a palm tree and the left leaning on a pyramid inscribed celebrated throughout the world for her wonders the smaller pictures are the entrance of magnus into the port of alexandria rosetta with a caravan of turks and different nations the city of grand cairo exterior and interior with views of other places and finally his return to venice his journey to rome the centre figure an armed palace seated on trophies the tiber beneath her feet a globe in her hands inscribed cold rarum victrix ac domina besides she is the conqueress and mistress of the world the ten small pictures are views of the cities in the pope's dominion 
his first audience at the conclave forms a pleasing and fine composition his travels into syria the principal figure is a female emblematical of that fine country she is seated in the midst of a gay orchard and embraces a bundle of roses inscribed mundi delicate the delight of the universe the small compartments are views of towns and ports and the spot where magnus collected his fleet his pilgrimage to jerusalem where he was made a knight of the holy sceptre the principal figure represents devotion inscribed dulcet it is she who conducts me the compartments exhibit a variety of objects with a correctness of drawing which is described as belonging to the class and partaking of the charms of the pencil of claude lorraine his vessel is first viewed in the roadstead at venice beat by a storm arrives at zante to refresh enters the port of simso there having landed he and his companions are proceeding to the town on asses for christians were not permitted to travel in turkey on horses in the church at jerusalem the bishop in his pontifical habit receives him as a knight of the holy sceptre arraying him in the armor of godfrey of bullion and placing his sword in the hands of magnus his arrival at bethlehem to see the cradle of the lord and his return by jaffa with his companions in the dress of pilgrims the groups are finely contrasted with the turks mingling amongst them the taking of the city of phagmusta and his slavery the middle figure with a dog at its feet represents fidelity the character of magnus who ever preferred it to his life or his freedom inscribed captivate she has reduced me to slavery six smaller pictures exhibit the different points on the island of cyprus where the turks effected their descents magnus retreating to phagmagusta which he long defended and where his cousin a skilful engineer was killed the Turks compelled to raise the siege, but return with greater forces. The sacking of the town and the palace where Magnus was taken. One picture exhibits he brought before a bagshaw, who has him stripped, to judge of his strength and fix his price, when, after examination, he is sent among other slaves he is seen bound and tied up among his companions in misfortune again he is forced to labor and carries a cask of water on his shoulders in another picture his master finding him weak of body conducts him to a slave merchant to sell him in another we see him leading an ass loaded with packages his new master finding him loitering on his way showers his blows on him while a soldier is seen purloining one of the packages from the ass another exhibits magnus sinking with fatigue on the sands while his master would raise him up by an up unsparing use of the bastinado the very details of these little paintings are pleasingly executed the close of his slavery the middle figure kneeling to heaven and a light breaking from it inscribed he breaks my chains to express the confidence of magnus the turks are seen landing with their pillage and their slaves in one of the pictures are seen two ships on fire a young lady of cyprus preferring death to the loss of her honor and the miseries of slavery determined to set fire to the vessel in which she was carried she succeeded and the flames communicated to another his return to venice the painter for his principal figure has chosen a palace with a helmet on her head 
the aegis on one arm and her lance in the other to describe the courage with which magnus had supported his misfortunes inscribed reduce it she brings me back in the last of the compartments he is seen at the custom house in venice he enters the house of his father the old man hastens to meet him and embraces him one page is filled by a single picture which represents the senate of venice with the doge on his throne magnus presents an account of his different employments and holds in his hand a scroll on which is written quod commissisti perfecti quod restat agedum par feed complicar i have done what you committed to my care and i will perform with the same fidelity which remains to be done he is received by the senate with the most distinguished honors and is not only justified but praised and honored the most magnificent of these paintings is the one attributed to paul verontz it is described by the duc de la valliere as almost unparalleled for its richness its elegance and its brilliancy it is inscribed pater mousse et fratier me delinquent me dominus autum assumpsit me my father and my brothers abandoned me but the lord took me under his protection this is an allusion to the accusation raised against him in the open senate when the turks took the isle of cyprus and his family wanted either the confidence or the courage to defend magnus in the front of this large picture magnus leading his son by the hand conducts him to be reconciled with his brothers and sisters-in-law who are on the opposite side his hands hold the scroll vo contasilis de me malum sed deus converti ild il bonum you thought ill of me but the lord has turned it to good in this he alludes to the satisfaction he has given the senate and to the honors they had decreed him another scene is introduced where magnus appears in a magnificent hall at a table in the midst of all his family with whom a general reconciliation has taken place on his left hand are gardens opening with an enchanting effect and magnificently ornamented with the villa of his father on which flowers and wreaths seem dropping on the roof as if from heaven in the perspective the landscape probably represents the rural neighborhood of magnus early days such are the most interesting incidents which i have selected from the copious description of the duc de la valliere the idea of this production is new an autobiography in a series of remarkable scenes painted under the eye of the describer of them in which too he has preserved all the fullness of his feelings and his minutest recollections but the novelty becomes interesting from the character of the noble magnus and the romantic fancy which in this elaborate and costly curiosity it was not indeed without some trouble that i have drawn up this little account but while thus employed i seem to be composing a very uncommon romance end of section fifteen recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c Section 16 of Curiosities of Literature, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bruce Peary. Curiosities of Literature, Volume 3 by Isaac Disraeli. Cause and Pretext 
it is an important principle in morals and in politics not to mistake the cause for the pretext nor the pretext for the cause and by this means to distinguish between the concealed and the ostensible motive on this principle history might be recomposed in a new manner it would not often describe circumstances and characters as they usually appear when we mistake the characters of men we mistake the nature of their actions and we shall find in the study of secret history that some of the most important events in modern history were produced from very different motives than their ostensible ones polybius the most philosophical writer of the ancients has marked out this useful distinction of cause and pretext and aptly illustrates the observation by the facts which he explains Amilcar, for instance was the first author and contriver of the second punic war though he died ten years before the commencement of it a statesman says the wise and grave historian who knows not how to trace the origin of events and discern the different sources from whence they take their rise may be compared to a physician who neglects to inform himself of the causes of those distempers which he is called in to cure our pains can never be better employed than in searching out the causes of events for the most trifling incidents give birth to matters of the greatest moment and importance the latter part of this remark of polybius points out another principle which has been often verified by history and which furnished the materials of the little book of grand événements par les petites causes our present inquiry concerns cause and pretext leo x projected an alliance of the sovereigns of christendom against the turks the avowed object was to oppose the progress of the ottomans against the mamelukes of egypt who were more friendly to the christians but the concealed motive with his holiness was to enrich himself and his family with the spoils of christendom and to aggrandize the papal throne by war and such indeed the policy of these pontiffs had always been in those mad crusades which they excited against the east the reformation excellent as its results have proved in the cause of genuine freedom originated in no purer source than human passions and selfish motives it was the progeny of avarice in germany of novelty in france and of love in england the latter is elegantly alluded to by gray and gospel light first beamed from bolen's eyes the reformation is considered by the duke of navarre in a work printed in fifteen ninety as it had been by francis i in his apology in fifteen thirty seven as a coup d'etat of charles v towards universal monarchy the duke says that the emperor silently permitted luther to establish his principles in germany that they might split the confederacy of the elective princes and by this division facilitate their more easy conquest and play them off one against another and by these means to secure the imperial crown hereditary in the house of austria had charles v not been the mere creature of his politics and had he felt any zeal for the catholic cause which he pretended to fight for never would he have allowed the new doctrines to spread for more than twenty years without the least opposition the famous league in france was raised for religion and the relief of public grievances such was the pretext after the princes and the people had alike become its victims this league was discovered to have been formed by the pride and the ambition of the guises aided by the machinations of the jesuits against the attempts of the prince of conde to dislodge them from their seat of power while the huguenots pillaged burnt and massacred declaring in their manifestos that they were only fighting to release the king whom they asserted was a prisoner of the guises the catholics repaid them with the same persecution and the same manifestos declaring that they only wished to liberate the prince of conde who was the prisoner of the huguenots the people were led on by the cry of religion but this civil war was not in reality so much catholic against huguenot as guise against conde 
a parallel event occurred between our charles the first and the scotch covenanters and the king expressly declared in a large declaration concerning the late tumults in scotland that religion is only pretended and used by them as a cloak to palliate their intended rebellion which he demonstrated by the facts he alleged there was a revolutionary party in france which taking the name of frondaire shook that kingdom under the administration of cardinal mazarin and held out for their pretext the public freedom but that faction composed of some of the discontented french princes and the mob was entirely organized by cardinal de retz who held them in hand to check or to spur them as the occasion required from a mere personal pique against mazarin who had not treated that vivacious genius with all the deference he exacted this appears from his own memoirs we have smiled at james the first threatening the states-general by the english ambassador about vorstius a dutch professor who had espoused the doctrines of arminius against those of the contra remonstrants or calvinists the ostensible subject was religious or rather metaphysical religious doctrines but the concealed one was a struggle for predominance between the pensionary barnevelt assisted by the french interest and the prince of orange supported by the english these were the real sources says lord hardwick a statesman and a man of letters deeply conversant with secret and public history and a far more able judge than diodati the swiss divine and brandt the ecclesiastical historian who in the synod of dort could see nothing but what appeared in it and gravely narrated the idle squabbles on phrases concerning predestination or grace hales of eton who was secretary to the english ambassador at the synod perfectly accords with the account of lord hardwick our synod writes that judicious observer goes on like a watch the main wheels upon which the whole business turns are least in sight for all things of moment are acted in private sessions what is done in public is only for show and entertainment the cause of the persecution of the jansenists was the jealousy of the jesuits the pretext was la grâce suffisante the learned lacrose observes that the same circumstance occurred in the affair of nestorius and the church of alexandria the pretext was orthodoxy the cause was the jealousy of the church of alexandria or rather the fiery and turbulent cyril who personally hated nestorius the opinions of nestorius and the council which condemned them were the same in effect i only produce this remote fact to prove that ancient times do not alter the truth of our principle when james the second was so strenuous an advocate for toleration and liberty of conscience in removing the test act this enlightened principle of government was only a pretext with that monk-ridden monarch it is well known that the cause was to introduce and make the catholics predominant in his councils and government the result which that eager and blind politician hurried on too fast and which therefore did not take place would have been that liberty of conscience would soon have become an overt act of treason before an inquisition of his jesuits in all political affairs drop the pretexts and strike at the causes we may thus understand what the heads of parties may choose to conceal End of section 16. Section 17 of Curiosities of Literature, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Annie Hill. Curiosities of Literature, Volume 3 by Isaac Disraeli section seventeen political forgeries and fictions a writer whose learning gives value to his eloquence in his brampton lectures has censured with that liberal spirit so friendly to the cause of truth 
the calumnies and rumours of parties which are still industriously retailed though they have been often confuted forged documents are still referred to or tales unsupported by evidence are confidently quoted mr heber's subject confined his inquiries to theological history he has told us that augustine is not ashamed in his dispute with faustus to take advantage of the popular slanders against the followers of mains though his own experience for he had himself been of that sect was sufficient to detect this falsehood footnote eighty four the romanists in spite of satisfactory answers have continued to urge against the english protestant the romance of parker's consecration and footnote eighty four while the protestant persists in falsely imputing to the catholic public formularies the systematic omission of the second commandment the calumnies of rimius and stinstra against the moravian brethren are cases in point continues mr heber no one now believes them yet they once could deceive even warburton we may also add the obsolete calumny of jews crucifying boys of which a monument raised to hugh of lincoln perpetuates the memory and which a modern historian records without any scruple of doubt several authorities which are cited on this occasion amount only to the single one of matthew paris who gives it as a popular rumour footnote eighty five such accusations usually happened when the jews were too rich and the king was too poor End footnote eighty five the falsehoods and forgeries raised by parties are overwhelming it startles a philosopher in the calm of his study when he discovers how writers who we may presume are searchers after truth should in fact turn out to be searchers after the grossest fictions this alters the habits of the literary man it is an unnatural depravity of his pursuits and it proves that the personal is too apt to predominate over the literary character i have already touched on the main point of the present article in the one on political names i have there shown how political calumny appears to have been reduced to an art one of its branches would be that of converting forgeries and fiction into historical authorities when one nation is at war with another there is no doubt that the two governments connive at and often encourage the most atrocious libels on each other to madden the people to preserve their independence and contribute cheerfully to the expenses of war france and england formerly complained of holland the athenians employed the same policy against the macedonians and persians such is the origin of a vast number of suppositious papers and volumes which sometimes at a remote date confound the labours of the honest historian and too often serve the purposes of the dishonest with whom they become authorities the crude and suspicious libels which were drawn out of their obscurity in cromwell's time against james i have overloaded the character of that monarch yet are now eagerly referred to by party writers though in their own days they were obsolete and doubtful during the civil wars of charles i such spurious documents exist in the forms of speeches which were never spoken of letters never written by the names subscribed printed declarations never declared battles never fought and victories never obtained such is the language of rushworth who complains of this evil spirit of party forgeries while he himself suspected of having rescinded or suppressed whatever was not agreeable to his patron cromwell a curious and perhaps a necessary list might be drawn up of political forgeries of our own which have been sometimes referred to as genuine but which are the inventions of wits and satirists bale ingeniously observes that at the close of every century such productions should be branded by a skilful discriminator to save the future inquirer from errors he can hardly avoid 
how many are still kept in error by the satires of the sixteenth century those of the present age will be no less active in future ages for they will still be preserved in public libraries the art and skill with which some have fabricated a forged narrative render its detection almost hopeless when the young maitland the brother to the secretary in order to palliate the crime of the assassination of the regent murray was employed to draw up a pretended conference between him knox and others to stigmatize them by the odium of advising to dethrone the young monarch and to substitute the regent for their sovereign maitland produced so dramatic a performance by giving to each person his peculiar mode of expression that this circumstance long baffled the incredulity of those who could not in consequence deny the truth of a narrative apparently so correct in its particulars the fiction of the warming-pan enclosing the young pretender brought more adherence to the cause of the whigs than the bill of rights observes lord john russell among such party narratives the horrid tale of the bloody colonel kirk has been worked up by hume with all his eloquence and pathos and from its interest no suspicion has arisen of its truth yet so far as it concerns kirk or the reign of james the second or even english history it is as ritson too honestly expressed it an impudent and barefaced lie the simple fact is told by kennett in a few words he probably was aware of the nature of this political fiction hume was not indeed himself the fabricator of the tale but he had not any historical authority the origin of this fable was probably a pious fraud of the whig party to whom kirk had rendered himself odious at that moment stories still more terrifying were greedily swallowed and which ritson insinuates have become a part of the history of england the original story related more circumstantially though not more affectingly nor perhaps more truly may be found in wanley's wonders of the little world which i give relieving it from the tediousness of old wanley a governor of zealand under the bold duke of burgundy had in vain sought to seduce the affections of the beautiful wife of a citizen the governor imprisons the husband on an accusation of treason and when the wife appeared as the suppliant the governor after no brief eloquence succeeded as a lover on the plea that her husband's life could only be spared by her compliance the woman in tears and in aversion and not without a hope of vengeance only delayed lost her honour pointing to the prison the governor told her if you seek your husband enter there and take him along with you the wife in the bitterness of her thoughts yet not without the consolation that she had snatched her husband from the grave passed into the prison there in a cell to her astonishment and horror she beheld the corpse of her husband laid out in a coffin ready for burial mourning over it she at length returned to the governor fiercely exclaiming you have kept your word you have restored to me my husband and be assured the favour shall be repaid the inhuman villain terrified in the presence of his intrepid victim attempted to appease her vengeance and more to win her to his wishes returning home she assembled her friends revealed her whole story and under their protection she appealed to charles the bold a strict lover of justice and who now awarded a singular but exemplary catastrophe the duke first commanded that the criminal governor should instantly marry the woman who he had made a widow and at the same time sign his will with a clause importing that should he die before his lady he constituted her his heiress all this was concealed from both sides rather to satisfy the duke than the parties themselves this done the unhappy woman was dismissed alone the governor was conducted to the prison to suffer the same death he had inflicted on the husband of his wife and when this lady was desired once more to enter the prison she beheld her second husband headless in his coffin as she had her first 
such extraordinary incidences in so short a period overpowered the feeble frame of the sufferer she died leaving a son who inherited the rich accession of fortune so fatally obtained by his injured and suffering mother such is the tale of which the party story of kirk appeared to ritson to have been a rifacimento but it is rather the foundation than the superstructure this critic was right in the general but not in the particular it was not necessary to point out the present source when so many others of a parallel nature exist this tale universally told mr deuce considers as the original of measure for measure and was probably some traditional event for it appears some time with a change of names and places without any of incident it always turns on a soldier a brother or a husband executed and a wife a sister a deceived victim to save them from death it was therefore easily transferred to kirk and pomfret's poem of cruelty and lust long made the story popular it could only have been in this form that it reached the historian who it must be observed introduces it as a story commonly told of him but popular tragic romances should not enter into the dusty documents of a history of england and much less be particularly specified in the index Bellaforest, in his old version of the tale has even the circumstance of the captain who having seduced the wife under the promise to save her husband's life exhibited him soon afterwards through the window of her apartment suspended on a gibbet this forms the horrid incident in the history of the bloody colonel and served the purpose of a party who wished to bury him in odium kirk was a soldier of fortune and a loose liver and a great blusterer who would sometimes threaten to decimate his own regiment but it is said to have forgotten the menace the next day footnote eighty seven hateful as such military men will always be in the present instance colonel kirk has been shamefully calumniated by poets and historians who suffer themselves to be duped by the forgery of political parties End of footnote eighty seven while we are detecting a source of error into which the party feelings of modern historians may lead them let us confess that they are far more valuable than the ancient for us to at least the ancients have written history without producing authorities modern historians must furnish their readers with the truest means to become their critics by providing them with their authorities and it is only by judiciously appreciating these that we may confidently accept their discoveries unquestionably the ancients have often introduced into their histories many tales similar to the story of kirk popular or party forgeries the mellifluous copiousness of levy conceals many a tale of wonder the graver of tacitus etches many a fatal stroke and the secret history of suetonius too often raises a suspicion of those whispers quid rex in aurem regne dixerit quid juno fabuleta sit cum jove it is certain that plutarch has often told and varied too in the telling the same story which he has applied to different persons a critic in the ritsonian style has said of the grave plutarch mendix il plutarchus qui vitas oratorum dolis et error ibus consutas olim conscrib elavi that lying plutarch who formerly scribbled the lives of the orators made up of falsities and blunders there is in italian a scarce book of better design than execution of the abbot lantialotti far feloni degli antici historici flim flams of the ancients modern historians have to dispute their passage to immortality step by step and however fervid be their eloquence their real test as to value must be brought to the humble references in their margin yet these must not terminate our inquiries for in tracing a story to its original source we shall find that fictions have been sometimes grafted on truths or hearsays and to separate them as they appeared in their first stage is the pride and glory of learned criticism footnote eighty four
absurdly reported to have taken place at a meeting in the nags head tavern cheapside footnote eighty five m michael published in paris in eighteen thirty four a collection of poems and ballads concerning hugh of lincoln which were all very popular at home and abroad in the middle ages one of these preserved in an anglo-norman museum in the bibliothèque royale at paris was evidently constructed to be sung by the people soon after the event which is stated to have happened in the reign of our henry the third but there are many ballads comparatively modern which show how carefully the story was kept before the populace and may be seen in the collections of bishop percy jameson motherwell and c footnote eighty seven a story still more absurd was connected with the name of colonel lunsford a soldier who consistently defended charles i and was killed in sixteen forty three it is related by eckhard as reported of him that he would kill and eat the children of the opposite party this horridly grotesque imputation has been preserved in the political ballads and poetry of the day cleveland ridicules it in one of his poems where he makes a roundhead declare he swore he saw when lunsford fell a child's arm in his pocket end of footnotes end of section seventeen section eighteen of curiosities of literature volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by bruce peary curiosities of literature volume three by isaac disraeli expression of suppressed opinion a people denied the freedom of speech or of writing have usually left some memorials of their feelings in that silent language which addresses itself to the eye many ingenious inventions have been contrived to give vent to their suppressed indignation the voluminous grievance which they could not trust to the voice or the pen they have carved in wood or sculptured on stone and have sometimes even facetiously concealed their satire among the playful ornaments designed to amuse those of whom they so fruitlessly complained such monuments of the suppressed feelings of the multitude are not often inspected by the historian their minuteness escapes all eyes but those of the philosophical antiquary nor are these satirical appearances always considered as grave authorities which unquestionably they will be found to be by a close observer of human nature an entertaining history of the modes of thinking or the discontents of a people drawn from such dispersed efforts in every era would cast a new light of secret history over many dark intervals did we possess a secret history of the saturnalia it would doubtless have afforded some materials for the present article in those revels of venerable radicalism when the senate was closed and the pileus or cap of liberty was triumphantly worn all things assumed an appearance contrary to what they were and human nature as well as human laws might be said to have been parodied among so many whimsical regulations in favour of the licentious rabble there was one which forbade the circulation of money if any one offered the coin of the state it was to be condemned as an act of madness and the man was brought to his senses by a penitential fast for that day an ingenious french antiquary seems to have discovered a class of wretched metals cast in lead or copper which formed the circulating medium of these mob lords who to ridicule the idea of money used the basest metals stamping them with grotesque figures or odd devices such as a sow a chimerical bird an imperator in his car with a monkey behind him or an old woman's head aca laurentia either the traditional old nurse of romulus or an old courtesan of the same name who bequeathed the fruits of her labours to the roman people as all things were done in mockery this base metal is stamped with s c to ridicule the senatus consulto which our antiquary happily explains in the true spirit of this government of mockery saturnalium consulto agreeing with the legend of the reverse inscribed in the midst of four tali or bones which they used as dice 
qui ludit aram det quod satis sit let them who play give a pledge which will be sufficient footnote baudelot de derville de l'utilite des voyages two six forty five there is a work by ficaroni on these lead coins or tickets they are found in the cabinets of the curious medalist pinkerton in referring to this entertaining work regrets that such curious remains have almost escaped the notice of medalists and have not yet been arranged in one class or named a special work on them would be highly acceptable the time has perhaps arrived when antiquaries may begin to be philosophers and philosophers antiquaries the unhappy separation of erudition from philosophy and of philosophy from erudition has hitherto thrown impediments in the progress of the human mind and the history of man End of footnote. this mock money served not only as an expression of the native irony of the radical gentry of rome during their festival but had they spoken their mind out meant a ridicule of money itself for these citizens of equality have always imagined that society might proceed without this contrivance of a medium which served to represent property in which they themselves must so little participate a period so glorious for exhibiting the suppressed sentiments of the populace as were these saturnalia had been nearly lost to us had not some notions been preserved by lucian for we glean but sparingly from the solemn pages of the historian except in the remarkable instance which suetonius has preserved of the arch mime who followed the body of the emperor vespasian at his funeral this officer as well as a similar one who accompanied the general to whom they granted a triumph and who was allowed the unrestrained licentiousness of his tongue were both the organs of popular feeling and studied to gratify the rabble who were their real masters on this occasion the arch mime representing both the exterior personage and the character of vespasian according to custom inquired the expense of the funeral he was answered ten millions of sesterces in allusion to the love of money which characterized the emperor his mock representative exclaimed give me the money and if you will throw my body into the tiber all these mock offices and festivals among the ancients i consider as organs of the suppressed opinions and feelings of the populace who were allowed no other and had not the means of the printing ages to leave any permanent records at a later period before the discovery of the art which multiplies with such facility libels or panegyrics when the people could not speak freely against those rapacious clergy who sheared the fleece and cared not for the sheep many a secret of popular indignation was confided not to books for they could not read but to pictures and sculptures which are books which the people can always read the sculptors and illuminators of those times no doubt shared in common the popular feelings and boldly trusted to the paintings or the carvings which met the eyes of their luxurious and indolent masters their satirical inventions as far back as in thirteen hundred we find in wolfius the description of a picture of this kind in a manuscript of aesop's fables found in the abbey of fulda among other emblems of the corrupt lives of the churchmen the present was a wolf large as life wearing a monkish cowl with a shaven crown preaching to a flock of sheep with these words of the apostle in a label from his mouth god is my witness how i long for you all in my bowels and underneath was inscribed this hooded wolf is the hypocrite of whom is said in the gospel beware of false prophets such exhibitions were often introduced into articles of furniture a cushion was found in an old abbey in which was worked a fox preaching to geese each goose holding in his bill his praying beads in the stone wall and on the columns of the great church at strasbourg was once viewed a number of wolves bears foxes and other mischievous animals carrying holy water crucifixes and tapers and others more indelicate these probably as old as the year thirteen hundred 
were engraven in 1617 by a Protestant, and were not destroyed till 1685 by the pious rage of the Catholics, who seemed at length to have rightly construed these silent lampoons, and in their turn broke to pieces the Protestant images, as the others had done the papistical dolls the carved seats and stalls in our own cathedrals exhibit subjects not only strange and satirical but even indecent footnote many specimens may be seen in carter's curious volumes on ancient architecture and painting End of footnote. at the time they built churches they satirized the ministers a curious instance how the feelings of the people struggle to find a vent it is conjectured that rival orders satirized each other and that some of the carvings are caricatures of certain monks the margins of illuminated manuscripts frequently contain ingenious caricatures or satirical allegories in a magnificent chronicle of froissart i observed several a wolf as usual in a monk's frock and cowl stretching his paw to bless a cock bending its head submissively to the wolf or a fox with a crozier dropping beads which a cock is picking up to satirize the blind devotion of the bigots perhaps the figure of the cock alluded to our gallic neighbors a cat in the habit of a nun holding a platter in its paws to a mouse approaching to lick it alluding to the allurements of the abbesses to draw young women into their convents while sometimes i have seen a sow in an abbess's veil mounted on stilts the sex marked by the sow's dugs a pope sometimes appears to be thrust by devils into a cauldron and cardinals are seen roasting on spits these ornaments must have been generally executed by the monks themselves but these more ingenious members of the ecclesiastical order appear to have sympathized with the people like the curates in our church and envied the pampered abbot and the purple bishop churchmen were the usual objects of the suppressed indignation of the people in those days but the knights and feudal lords have not always escaped from the curses not loud but deep of their satirical pencils as the reformation or rather the revolution was hastening this custom became so general that in one of the dialogues of erasmus where two franciscans are entertained by their host it appears that such satirical exhibitions were hung up as common furniture in the apartments of inns the facetious genius of erasmus either invents or describes one which he had seen of an ape in the habit of a franciscan sitting by a sick man's bed dispensing ghostly counsel holding up a crucifix in one hand while with the other he is filching a purse out of the sick man's pocket such are the straws by which we may always observe from what corner the wind rises mr dibden has recently informed us that gayler whom he calls the herald of the reformation preceding luther by twelve years had a stone chair or pulpit in the cathedral at strasburg from which he delivered his lectures or rather rolled the thunders of his anathemas against the monks this stone pulpit was constructed under his own superintendence and is covered with very indecent figures of monks and nuns expressly designed by him to expose their profligate manners we see gayler doing what for centuries had been done in the curious folios of sauval the stow of france there is a copious chapter entitled Heretique l'air attentat in this enumeration of their attempts to give vent to their suppressed indignation it is very remarkable that preceding the time of luther the minds of many were perfectly lutheran respecting the idolatrous worship of the roman church and what i now notice would have rightly entered into that significant historia reformationis ante reformationem which was formerly projected by continental writers luther did not consign the pope's decretals to the flames till fifteen twenty this was the first open act of reformation and insurrection for hitherto he had submitted to the court of rome yet in fourteen ninety thirty years preceding this great event i find a priest burnt for having snatched the host in derision from the hands of another celebrating mass twelve years afterwards fifteen o two 
a student repeated the same deed trampling on it and in fifteen twenty three the resolute death of anne de bourg a councillor in the parliament of paris to use the expression of sauval corrupted the world it is evident that the huguenots were fast on the increase from that period i find continued accounts which prove that the huguenots of france like the puritans of england were most resolute iconoclasts they struck off the heads of virgins and little jesuses or blunted their daggers by chipping the wooden saints which were then fixed at the corners of streets every morning discovered the scandalous treatment they had undergone in the night then their images were painted on the walls but these were heretically scratched and disfigured and since the saints could not defend themselves a royal edict was published in their favour commanding that all holy paintings in the streets should not be allowed short of ten feet from the ground they entered churches at night tearing up or breaking down the prians the benitoires the crucifixes the colossal ecce homos which they did not always succeed in dislodging for want of time or tools amidst these battles with wooden adversaries we may smile at the frequent solemn processions instituted to ward off the vengeance of the parish saint the wooden was expiated by a silver image secured by iron bars and attended by the king and the nobility carrying the new saint with prayers that he would protect himself from the heretics in an early period of the reformation an instance occurs of the art of concealing what we wish only the few should comprehend at the same time that we are addressing the public curious collectors are acquainted with the olivetan bible this was the first translation published by the protestants and there seems no doubt that calvin was the chief if not the only translator but at that moment not choosing to become responsible for this new version he made use of the name of an obscure relative robert pierre olivetan calvin however prefixed a latin preface remarkable for delivering positions very opposite to those tremendous doctrines of absolute predestination which in his theological despotism he afterwards assumed de bure describes this first protestant bible not only as rare but when found as usually imperfect much soiled and dog-eared as the well-read first edition of shakespeare by the perpetual use of the multitude but a curious fact has escaped the detection both of de bure and below at the end of the volume are found ten verses which in a concealed manner authenticate the translation and which no one unless initiated into the secret could possibly suspect the verses are not poetical but i give the first sentence lecteur entend si verite adresse vient donc ouir instamment sa promesse et vif parler etc the first letters of every word of these ten verses form a perfect distich containing information important to those to whom the olivetan bible was addressed les vaudois peuple évangélique ont mis ce trésor en public an anagram would have been too inartificial a contrivance to have answered the purpose of concealing from the world at large this secret there is an adroitness in the invention of the initial letters of all the words through these ten verses they contained a communication necessary to authenticate the version but which at the same time could not be suspected by any person not entrusted with the secret when the art of metal engraving was revived in europe the spirit we are now noticing took possession of those less perishable and more circulating vehicles satiric medals were almost unknown to the ancient mint notwithstanding those of the saturnalia and a few which bear miserable puns on the unlucky names of some consuls medals illustrate history and history reflects light on medals but we should not place such unreserved confidence on medals as their advocates who are warm in their favorite study it has been asserted that medals are more authentic memorials than history itself but a medal is not less susceptible of the bad passions than a pamphlet or an epigram 
ambition has its vanity and engraves a dubious victory and flattery will practise its art and deceive us in gold a calumny or a fiction on metal may be more durable than on a fugitive page and a libel has a better chance of being preserved when the artist is skilful than simple truths when miserably executed medals of this class are numerous and were the precursors of those political satires exhibited in caricature prints footnote the series published during the wars in the low countries are the most remarkable and may be seen in the volumes by van loon End of footnote. there is a large collection of wooden cuts about the time of calvin where the romish religion is represented by the most grotesque forms which the ridicule of the early reformers could invent more than a thousand figures attest the exuberant satire of the designers this work is equally rare and costly footnote mr deuce possessed a portion of this very curious collection for a complete one de bure asked about twenty pounds End of footnote satires of this species commenced in the freedom of the reformation for we find a medal of luther in a monk's habit satirically bearing for its reverse catherine de bora the nun whom this monk married the first step of his personal reformation nor can we be certain that catherine was not more concerned in that great revolution than appears in the voluminous lives we have of the great reformer however the reformers were as great sticklers for medals as the papelin of pope john the eighth an effeminate voluptuary we have a medal with his portrait inscribed pope joan and another of innocent the tenth dressed as a woman holding a spindle the reverse his famous mistress donna olympia dressed as a pope with the tiara on her head and the keys of saint peter in her hands footnote the roman satirists also invented a tale to ridicule what they dared not openly condemn in which it was asserted that a play called the marriage of the pope was enacted before cromwell in which the donna having obtained the key of paradise from innocent insists on that of purgatory also that she may not be sent there when he is wearied of her the wedding is then kept by a ball of monks and nuns delighted to think they may one day marry also such was the means the romans took to notify their sense of the degradation of the pope End of footnote. when in the reign of mary england was groaning under spanish influence and no remonstrance could reach the throne the queen's person and government were made ridiculous to the people's eyes by prints or pictures representing her majesty naked meagre withered and wrinkled with every aggravated circumstance of deformity that could disgrace a female figure seated in a regal chair a crown on her head surrounded with m r and a in capitals accompanied by small letters maria regina angliae a number of spaniards were sucking her to skin and bone and a specification was added of the money rings jewels and other presents with which she had secretly gratified her husband philip it is said that the queen suspected some of her own council of this invention who alone were privy to these transactions it is however in this manner that the voice which is suppressed by authority comes at length in another shape to the eye the age of elizabeth when the roman pontiff and all his adherents were odious to the people produced a remarkable caricature and ingenious invention a gorgon's head a church bell forms the helmet the ornaments instead of the feathers are a wolf's head in a mitre devouring a lamb an ass's head with spectacles reading a goose holding a rosary the face is made out with a fish for the nose a chalice and water for the eye and other priestly ornaments for the shoulder and breast on which rolls of parchment pardons hang footnote this ancient caricature so descriptive of the popular feelings is tolerably given in malcolm's history of caricaturing plate two figure one End of footnote a famous bishop of munster 
bernard de galen who in his charitable violence for converting protestants got himself into such celebrity that he appears to have served as an excellent signpost to the inns in germany was the true church militant and his figure was exhibited according to the popular fancy his head was half mitre and half helmet a crozier in one hand and a sabre in the other half a rochet and half a cuirass he was made performing mass as a dragoon on horseback and giving out the charge when he ought the ita missa est he was called the converter and the bishop of munster became popular as a signpost in german towns for the people like fighting men though they should even fight against themselves it is rather curious to observe of this new species of satire so easily distributed among the people and so directly addressed to their understandings that it was made the vehicle of national feeling ministers of state condescended to invent the devices lord orford says that caricatures on cards were the invention of george townsend in the affair of bing which was soon followed by a pack i am informed of an ancient pack of cards which has caricatures of all the parliamentarian generals which might be not unusefully shuffled by a writer of secret history footnote this pack was probably executed in holland in the time of charles the second there are other sets of political cards of the same reign particularly one connected with the so-called popish plots and the murder of sir edmundbury godfrey the south sea bubble was made the subject of a similar pack after it had exploded End of footnote. we may be surprised to find the grave sully practising this artifice on several occasions in the civil wars of france the duke of savoy had taken by surprise salus and struck a medal on the reverse a centaur appears shooting with a bow and arrow with the legend opportune but when henry the fourth had reconquered the town he published another on which hercules appears killing the centaur with the word opportunius the great minister was the author of this retort footnote the royal house of navarre was fancifully derived by the old heraldic writers from hispalus the son of hercules and the pageant provided by the citizens of avignon to greet his entrance there in sixteen hundred was entirely composed in reference thereto and henry indicated in its title l'hercule gaulois triomphant End of footnote a medal of the dutch ambassador at the court of france van buningen whom the french represent as a haughty burgomaster but who had the vivacity of a frenchman and the haughtiness of a spaniard as voltaire characterizes him is said to have been the occasion of the dutch war in sixteen seventy two but wars will hardly be made for an idle medal medals may however indicate a preparatory war louis the fourteenth was so often compared to the sun at its meridian that some of his creatures may have imagined that like the sun he could dart into any part of europe as he willed and be as cheerfully received footnote he took for a device and motto on his shield on the occasion of tilting matches and court festivities a representation of the sun in splendor and the words nec pluribus impar End of footnote. the dutch minister whose christian name was joshua however had a medal struck of joshua stopping the sun in his course inferring that this miracle was operated by his little republic the medal itself is engraven in van loon's voluminous histoire medallique du pays bas and in marchand's dictionnaire historique who labors to prove against twenty authors that the dutch ambassador was not the inventor it was not however unworthy of him and it conveyed to the world the high feeling of her power which holland had then assumed two years after the noise about this medal the republic paid dear for the device but thirty years afterwards this very burgomaster concluded a glorious peace and france and spain were compelled to receive the mediation of the dutch joshua with the french son footnote 
the history of this medal is useful in more than one respect and may be found in prosper marchand End of footnote. in these vehicles of national satire it is odd that the phlegmatic dutch more than any other nation and from the earliest period of their republic should have indulged freely if not licentiously it was a republican humour their taste was usually gross we owe to them even in the reign of elizabeth a severe medal on leicester who having retired in disgust from the government of their provinces struck a medal with his bust reverse a dog and sheep non gregum set ingratos in vitas de zero on which the angry juvenile states struck another representing an ape and young ones reverse leicester near a fire fugiens fumum incidit in ignum another medal with an excellent portrait of cromwell was struck by the dutch the protector crowned with laurels is on his knees laying his head in the lap of the commonwealth but loosely exhibiting himself to the french and spanish ambassadors with gross indecency the frenchman covered with fleur-de-lis is pushing aside the grave dawn and disputes with him the precedence retire toi l'honneur appartient au roi mon maître louis le grand van loon is very right in denouncing this same medal so grossly flattering to the english as most detestable and indelicate but why does van loon envy us this lumpish invention why does the dutchman quarrel with his own cheese the honour of the medal we claim but the invention belongs to his country the dutch went on commenting in this manner on english affairs from reign to reign charles the second declared war against them in sixteen seventy two for a malicious medal though the states-general offered to break the die by purchasing it of the workmen for one thousand ducats but it served for a pretext for a dutch war which charles cared more about than the malabestia of his exergue charles also complained of a scandalous picture which the brothers de witt had in their house representing a naval battle with the english charles the second seems to have been more sensible to this sort of national satire than we might have expected in a professed wit a race however who are not the most patient in having their own sauce returned to their lips the king employed evelyn to write a history of the dutch war and enjoined him to make it a little keen for the hollanders had very unhandsomely abused him in their pictures books and libels the dutch continued their career of conveying their national feeling on english affairs more triumphantly when their stadtholder ascended an english throne the birth of the pretender is represented by the chest which minerva gave to the daughters of Cecrops to keep and which opened discovered an infant with a serpent's tail infantumque vident apparectumque draconem the chest perhaps alluding to the removes of the warming pan and in another james and a jesuit flying in terror the king throwing away a crown and sceptre and the jesuit carrying a child ita missa est the words applied from the mass footnote another represents the young prince holding the symbol of the romish faith in his right hand and crowning himself with the left truth opens a door below and discovers father peter as the guiding influence of all End of footnote but in these contests of national feeling while the grandeur of louis the fourteenth did not allow of these ludicrous and satirical exhibitions and while the political idolatry which his forty academicians paid to him exhausted itself in the splendid fictions of a series of famous medals amounting to nearly four hundred it appears that we were not without our reprisals for i find prosper marchand who writes as a hollander censuring his own country for having at length adulated the grand monarch by a complimentary medal he says the english cannot be reproached with a similar debonair été. after the famous victories of marlborough they indeed inserted in a medal the head of the french monarch and the english queen with this inscription lodovicus magnus anna Major long ere this one of our queens had been exhibited by ourselves with considerable energy 
on the defeat of the armada elizabeth pinkerton tells us struck a medal representing the english and spanish fleets hesperidum regum de wicket virgo philip had medals dispersed in england of the same impression with this addition negatur es meritrix vulgi these the queen suppressed but published another medal with this legend hesperidum regum de wicket virgo negatur est meratrix vulgi res eo deterior an age fertile in satirical prints was the eventful era of charles the first they were showered from all parties and a large collection of them would admit of a critical historical commentary which might become a vehicle of the most curious secret history most of them are in a bad style for they are allegorical yet that these satirical exhibitions influenced the eyes and minds of the people is evident from an extraordinary circumstance two grave collections of historical documents adopted them we are surprised to find prefixed to rushworth's and nelson's historical collections two such political prints nelson's was an act of retributive justice but he seems to have been aware that satire in the shape of pictures is a language very attractive to the multitude for he has introduced a caricature print in the solemn folio of the trial of charles the first footnote it represents cromwell as an armed monster carrying the three kingdoms captive at his feet in a triumphal car driven by the devil over the body of liberty and the decapitated charles the first the state of the people is emblematized by a bird flying from its cage to be devoured by a hawk and sheep breaking from the fold to be set on by ravening wolves End of footnote. of the happiest of these political prints is one by taylor the water poet not included in his folio but prefixed to his mad fashions odd fashions or the emblems of these distracted times it is the figure of a man whose eyes have left their sockets and whose legs have usurped the place of his arms a horse on his hind legs is drawing a cart a church is inverted fish fly in the air a candle burns with the flame downwards and the mouse and rabbit are pursuing the cat and the fox the animosities of national hatred have been a fertile source of these vehicles of popular feeling which discover themselves in severe or grotesque caricatures the french and the spaniards mutually exhibit one another under the most extravagant figures the political caricatures of the french in the seventeenth century are numerous the badaux of paris amused themselves for their losses by giving an emetic to a spaniard to make him render up all the towns his victories had obtained seven or eight spaniards are seen seated around a large turnip with their frizzled mustachios their hats en pot a bear their long rapiers with their pummels down to their feet and their points up to their shoulders their ruffs stiffened by many rows and pieces of garlic stuck in their girdles the dutch were exhibited in as great variety as the uniformity of frogs would allow we have largely participated in the vindictive spirit which these grotesque emblems keep up among the people they mark the secret feelings of national pride the greeks despised foreigners and considered them only as fit to be slaves footnote a passage may be found in aristotle's politics volume one c three to seven where aristotle advises alexander to govern the greeks like his subjects and the barbarians like slaves for that the one he was to consider as companions and the other as creatures of an inferior race and a footnote the ancient jews inflated with a false idea of their small territory would be masters of the world the italians placed a line of demarcation for genius and taste and marked it by their mountains the spaniards once imagined that the conferences of god with moses on mount sinai were in the spanish language if a japanese become the friend of a foreigner he is considered as committing treason to his emperor and rejected as a false brother in a country which we are told is figuratively called tenka or the kingdom under the heavens john bullism 
is not peculiar to englishmen and patriotism is a noble virtue when it secures our independence without depriving us of our humanity the civil wars of the league in france and those in england under charles i bear the most striking resemblance and in examining the revolutionary scenes exhibited by the graver in the famous satire menipe we discover the foreign artist reveling in the caricature of his ludicrous and severe exhibition and in that other revolutionary period of la fronde there was a mania for political songs the curious have formed them into collections and we not only have the rump songs of charles i's times but have repeated this kind of evidence of the public feeling at many subsequent periods footnote the following may be mentioned as the most important of these collections rome rhymed to death sixteen eighty three a collection of the newest and most ingenious poems songs catches etc against popery sixteen eighty nine poems on affairs of state seventeen hundred and three to seven whig and tory or wit on both sides seventeen twelve political merriment or truths told to some tune seventeen fourteen end of footnote caricatures and political songs might with us furnish a new sort of history and perhaps would preserve some truths and describe some particular events not to be found in more grave authorities End of section 18. Section 19 of Curiosities of Literature, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bruce Peary curiosities of literature volume three by isaac disraeli autographs footnote a small volume which i met with at paris entitled l'art de juger du caractère des hommes sur leurs écritures is curious for its illustrations consisting of twenty-four plates exhibiting facsimiles of the writing of eminent and other persons correctly taken from the original autographs since this period both france and germany have produced many books devoted to the use of the curious in autographs in our own country j t smith published a curious collection of facsimiles of letters chiefly from literary characters End of footnote the art of judging of the characters of persons by their handwriting can only have any reality when the pen acting without restraint becomes an instrument guided by and indicative of the natural dispositions but regulated as the pen is now too often by a mechanical process which the present race of writing masters seem to have contrived for their own convenience a whole school exhibits a similar handwriting the pupils are forced in their automatic motions as if acted on by the pressure of a steam engine a bevy of beauties will now write such facsimiles of each other that in a heap of letters presented to the most sharp-sighted lover to select that of his mistress though like bassanio among the caskets his happiness should be risked on the choice he would despair of fixing on the right one all appearing to have come from the same rolling press even brothers of different tempers have been taught by the same master to give the same form to their letters the same regularity to their line and have made our handwritings as monotonous as are our characters in the present habits of society the true physiognomy of writing will be lost among our rising generation it is no longer a face that we are looking on but a beautiful mask of a single pattern and the fashionable handwriting of our young ladies is like the former tight lacing of their mother's youthful days when every one alike had what was supposed to be a fine shape assuredly nature would prompt every individual to have a distinct sort of writing as she has given a peculiar countenance a voice and a manner 
the flexibility of the muscles differs with every individual and the hand will follow the direction of the thoughts and the emotions and the habits of the writers the phlegmatic will portray his words while the playful haste of the volatile will scarcely sketch them the slovenly will blot and efface and scrawl while the neat and orderly minded will view themselves in the paper before their eyes the merchant's clerk will not write like the lawyer or the poet even nations are distinguished by their writing the vivacity and variableness of the frenchman and the delicacy and suppleness of the italian are perceptibly distinct from the slowness and strength of pen discoverable in the phlegmatic german dane and swede when we are in grief we do not write as we should in joy the elegant and correct mind which has acquired the fortunate habit of a fixity of attention will write with scarcely an erasure on the page as fenelon and gray and gibbon while we find in pope's manuscripts the perpetual struggles of correction and the eager and rapid interlineation struck off in heat lavater's notion of handwriting is by no means chimerical nor was general Paoli fanciful when he told mr northcott that he had decided on the character and dispositions of a man from his letters and the handwriting long before the days of lavater shenstone in one of his letters said i want to see mrs iago's handwriting that i may judge of her temper one great truth must however be conceded to the opponents of the physiognomy of writing general rules only can be laid down yet the vital principle must be true that the handwriting bears an analogy to the character of the writer as all voluntary actions are characteristic of the individual but many causes operate to counteract or obstruct this result i am intimately acquainted with the handwritings of five of our great poets the first in early life acquired among scottish advocates a handwriting which cannot be distinguished from that of his ordinary brothers the second educated in public schools where writing is shamefully neglected composes his sublime or sportive verses in a schoolboy's ragged scrawl as if he had never finished his tasks with the writing-master the third writes his highly wrought poetry in the common hand of a merchant's clerk from early commercial avocations the fourth has all that finished neatness which polishes his verses while the fifth is a specimen of a full mind not in the habit of correction or alteration so that he appears to be printing down his thoughts without a solitary erasure the handwriting of the first and third poets not indicative of their character we have accounted for the others are admirable specimens of characteristic autographs footnote it will be of interest to the reader to note the names of these poets in the consecutive order they are alluded to they are scott byron rogers moore and campbell End of footnote oldus in one of his curious notes was struck by the distinctness of character in the handwritings of several of our kings he observed nothing further than the mere fact and did not extend his idea to the art of judging of the natural character by the writing oldus has described these handwritings with the utmost correctness as i have often verified i shall add a few comments henry the eighth wrote a strong hand but as if he had seldom a good pen the vehemence of his character conveyed itself into his writing bold hasty and commanding i have no doubt the asserter of the pope's supremacy and its triumphant destroyer split many a good quill edward the sixth wrote a fair legible hand we have this promising young prince's diary written by his own hand in all respects he was an assiduous pupil and he had scarcely learnt to write and to reign when we lost him queen elizabeth writ an upright hand like the bastard italian she was indeed a most elegant calligrapher whom roger ascham had taught all the elegancies of the pen 
footnote he was also the tutor of lady jane grey and the author of one of our earliest and best works on education End of footnote. the french editor of the little autographical work i have noticed has given the autograph of her name which she usually wrote in a very large tall character and painfully elaborate he accompanies it with one of the scottish mary who at times wrote elegantly though usually in uneven lines when in haste and distress of mind in several letters during her imprisonment which i have read much the contrary the french editor makes this observation who could believe that these writings are of the same epoch the first denotes asperity and ostentation the second indicates simplicity softness and nobleness the one is that of elizabeth queen of england the other that of her cousin mary stuart the difference of these two handwritings answers most evidently to that of their characters james the first writ a poor ungainly character all awry and not in a straight line james certainly wrote a slovenly scrawl strongly indicative of that personal negligence which he carried into all the little things of life and buchanan who had made him an excellent scholar may receive the disgrace of his pupil's ugly scribble which sprawls about his careless and inelegant letters charles i wrote a fair open italian hand and more correctly perhaps than any prince we ever had charles was the first of our monarchs who intended to have domiciliated taste in the kingdom and it might have been conjectured from this unfortunate prince who so finely discriminated the manners of the different painters which are in fact their handwritings that he would not have been insensible to the elegancies of the pen charles the second wrote a little fair running hand as if wrote in haste or uneasy till he had done such was the writing to have been expected from this illustrious vagabond who had much to write often in odd situations and could never get rid of his natural restlessness and vivacity james the second writ a large fair hand it is characterized by his phlegmatic temper as an exact detailer of occurrences and the matter of business genius of the writer queen anne wrote a fair round hand that is the writing she had been taught by her master probably without any alteration of manner naturally suggested by herself the copying hand of a common character footnote since this article was written nichols has published a cleverly executed series of autographs of royal noble and illustrious persons of great britain in which the reader may study the accuracy of the criticism above given End of footnote. the subject of autographs associates itself with what has been dignified by its professors as calligraphy or the art of beautiful writing as i have something curious to communicate on that subject considered professionally it shall form our following article end of section nineteen